Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, as usual, I've never learned how to speedily do slides. I think there's something in Microsoft that really makes things difficult. Anyway, this is so, this is, I always put this on, first of all, because I love this quote. The secret of success <laughs> is sincerity. Once you can fake that, you've got it made. And I ch it says everything about what I think. The next thing, I think this is the essence of globalization, essentially international capital. At the top is mobile and is running circles around governments, quite frankly. That's Jeffrey Sachs, who one wouldn't really think of saying that, but he, you know, I, I quite like that quote. And this is the last quote I'm going to use. Persuasion works best when it's invisible. The most effective marketing worms its way into our consciousness, leaving intact the perception that we have reached our opinions and made our choices independently. So bear in mind, I'm talking from a, a child health, uh, you know, medical doctor perspective, and that, that really resonates with me. That's George Monbiot. Um, so first of all, I have to tell you, IDFAN's global network. We were the UK member of IDFAN. Um, we were set up in 1977 by charities such as Oxfam and Warren Want to address the problem and run the campaign such as the Nestle boycott. We couldn't the Nestle boycott, um, those, those organisations, charities, couldn't run the Nestle boycott themselves because of charity laws. Okay? Does everyone know the Nestle boycott? Do you know about it? Does yeah. anyone want to be told about told it about very it? quickly? Okay. okay uh, there'll be a little bit about it. The International Baby Food Network is a people's network of over two, now it's 273 groups in over 168 countries. So three quarters in the developing world. A lot of them very tiny organisation, one person and health worker generally, stuff under the bed or whatever. But say the Indian group's got 20 workers in England, we're tiny, absolutely minute, and we can't get any money. And if any of you are got money going, <laughs> give it to us. We, it's really difficult now. Um, it fans focus at these things, code monitoring, human rights advocacy, trade codex. We go to the codex alimentarius maternity protection, capacity building, contaminants, all these things. But sponsorship and conflicts of interest is right at the fore. But before I get to that, I want to just quickly run through normal conditions. Um, the world is a very unequal place. Now, we know since the millennium, many more people have better access to drinking water, sanitation and health care. However, still over one-third of the world's population, 2.5 billion lack <coughs> adequate sanitation, 750 million lack access to safe water. So these are basics that we mustn't forget. And when we talk about progress, people forget that actually people still do this. So much of the world's population has limited access to fuel, education, literacy and health care. Um, risks of formula feeding in those situations are, are ghastly. You, your infants are not, not breastfed are 15 times more likely to die from pneumonia and 11 times more likely to die of diarrhoea. And breastfeeding could prevent about 13% of all under five deaths. Another thing that people don't like talking about is deaths. And we talk about illness and everything, but actually babies die. Appropriate complementary feeding could prevent a further 6%. <laughs> So breastfeeding is far more effective than any other preventive intervention, even mortar and sanitation. The baby gets its food straight from the mother with nothing else, nothing else in the way. You haven't got any bottles, teats, warming, anything, reading of instructions, nothing. It's straight from the mother to the baby. The baby food market is built on trust. Parents, policymakers and health workers trust the brand. <coughs> In the 80s, Abbott Ross, for example, paid for architectural services separating mothers and babies and generations of bottle-fed babies. I met somebody not so long ago who said, yes, this hospital is still run on that basis because of that intervention. It goes on for decades and decades. Um, so that hospital will have trust that Abbott Ross came in out of the goodness of its heart to do something marvellous for the hospital. Um, the commercialization of formula on a grand scale was started in 1867 by the Swiss company Nestle. Um, it dominates the market still, but the second biggest player now is Danone. There's huge buying and selling. You know, Nestle buys Gerber and to, to keep track. And then it's recently bought Wyeth, so all the SMA brands. It's really difficult to keep track, as you were saying. But um, 
this is an and I love this advert because that's from 1936, showing Nestle and uh, bottle feeding. This is the sort of sponsorship that was going on in the 70s with the milk nurses. So company reps dressed up as milk nurses, and and develop. You know, people did not realise that they weren't doing anything wrong. They 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 just needed help. Companies were there to to advise the mothers, putting the babies onto the bottle. Um, and this is from a movie film that we're gonna. I'll tell you about later. But that movie film is called Tigers, and that's a whistleblower. He's working for Nestle in Pakistan, and he's just giving the nurse a bar of chocolate. That's all it takes. That's all it takes sometimes is a bar of chocolate. So just bear that in mind to get that get your in to see the doctor, to see the doctor, and the doctor a tape of music or something. Okay. Um, anyway, the, it's the, the families and the babies that count the cost. And when we talk about actually evaluating the cost, we have to think about that. Are you really going out and seeing what is happening about your partnership or your relationship? Are you really finding out? Um, way, way back and for a long time, the PR advice to companies like Nestle because of our campaigns has been... The benefits of cause-related marketing are long-term cause-related marketing, linking your product to a thing. You are building a surplus account for the times when you have a crisis. We know that. We know that that's what companies have been doing. So this is Saatchi and Saatchi advising Nestle then. What we have now is people power, right? In response to the whole um, way back, because I'm doing a whistle-stop tour in the, the, the last 40 years, Started in 1947, more and once, you know, revolt and sort of like examination of what was going on. So that was the baby killer then, and then it became the baby killer scandal. It translated into German, Nestle sues because they couldn't stand this, because it was called Nestle Kills Baby. And, <laughs> and, but actually then none started suing Bristol Myers in America in 75. 1976, Nestle won the libel case <coughs> on a technicality. Because, yes, they didn't go out and shoot the babies. No. It was, the, you know, it was other things. They, they just provided the formula. Um, but uh, they had to pay the costs, and they were severely criticised by the judge. So they'd been very cautious of going to court. Um, I'll come to that later. 1977, we the Nestle boycott was launched in America, as I said, and we came in in 1980. So I came in in 1980. Gay Palmer came in before. So the important thing to note here is the 79, Senator Edward Kennedy saying we need an international code. So it's the US, the, the home of marketing, that actually caused this whole thing to take off in terms of an international code, which is what you need. So they, they set up a US in government inquiry in looking into what was called commerciogenic malnutrition. <coughs> Nobody really thought about it. The, one of the women that was behind all this was thinking about Pepsi. And she said, no, but she was really worried, American lawyer. And she just said, I, I was really worried that Pepsi had got so big. Or was it Coca-Cola? Sorry, Coca-Cola had got so big. But nobody was looking at the lack of democracy and the power. So she then got waylaid into our baby milk issue, even though she didn't particularly want to go down that line. For her, it was seen as slightly breastfeeding. She didn't really want to. She was a, a feminist without children and she didn't she but she then realized how dreadful it was and felt she must do it so it's an interesting thing to come in and look at transnationals in general and then focus on on nestle um so these are the soft like i'm just sort of these are all things of publicity that we have because we we run the nestle boycott and i put that in for you rosie <laughs> A little bit of hay controversy there, because we're hoping that something will be done then. Um, but it all leads up to consumer protection tool, this international code at the World Health Assembly. Okay? Now, and then since then, we've had all these resolutions, which are fantastic, um, and they've strengthened and clarified. And in 1996, I'm really proud of 1996, because that was the first World Health Assembly resolution on conflicts of interest saying that governments should actually warn and, and, and stop conflicts of interest. Um, now, they also have the Convention on the Rights of the Child strengthening it, okay? And what IPFAN does is we monitor, and we, like, this is a chart here 
that has all the countries. So when that guy before me was saying about, we don't know about governments, well, there's lots of governments. There's about 70 governments. I do that, don't I? Yeah. 70 governments that have brought in that code that I'm talking about. And they would not have done it if they didn't have a consumer group like, like IBFAN behind them, helping them, telling them what was happening on the ground with the companies, feeding that back at the World Health Assembly so that they could then say, right, we do need to do something about that, or the free samples, it's not free samples anymore, it's free supplies, or all these different things that the market moves. It doesn't stay still. So you have to just every two years go back and tighten it up and do the next thing. So that's what that is. You can, you're welcome to come and have a look at that. And we do these reports, um, which again is good. That's great. Um, so we know that strong leg legislation is essential. It's absolutely clear to IBFAN as you talk to any of them. You know that a voluntary agreement doesn't. And in terms of countries with legislation, I was told it's not as strong as the Framework Convention because the Convention on Tobacco is a convention. And ours is a recommendation because the US blocked it. But we have had a lot of legislation come in. So don't, we're trying to build on the positive here. And, um, and it would have been dead and buried if it wasn't for our persistent saying we need to you know, do independent monitoring and not let it be captured by industry. This is a slide that shows you, this is from Euromonitor. The little grey ones at the bottom, if you can see them, that's India. India has a law that stops all marketing for the first two years, products in the first two years. And since 2002, when it came out, you can see it's just completely leveled off. Whereas this is China, where they do have a little bit of a law, but it's, they don't implement it. And it's just chaos in China at the moment with the baby food marketing. So it's really rising. And, and it's just unbelievable what's happening in China. So, um, so we know that, that it works. The industry knows that regulation works. Um, and we know that self-regulation will only work, as Tim said, as long as companies want it to. And Corinna, I thought, was going to be here, but she gave a presentation once, and self-regulation doesn't reduce the extent and impact of marketing either. The volume can increase. So you have sold like the Advertising Standards Authority, and everyone feels safe. And they think, oh, gosh, yes, the advertising issue industry has a very good thing, and we stop these adverts. But actually, then you don't... You disempower your government, which is what I'm, I wanted to get to. The government then starts thinking it's not, they don't need to regulate because we've already got these voluntary agreements. I just put this slide in. Industry response in 1981, the tobacco industry saw what was happening and said if the infant formula experience has put the multinational cause back by eight to ten years. So what happened then was that they wanted to develop counter-strategies and convince governments that there was no need for more international codes, regulations or conventions. So then you see this blossoming of all this CSR and type of counter-strategies that uh, the guy before me was, was talking about, it being used as a weapon, you know, uh, the CSR. This is how I see CSR being used as a weapon. So the, the companies needed to be seen as socially responsible and willing to self-regulate through voluntary codes. It's absolutely essential to them. And this I quite like if we pass forward. This is, I, as I say, I was a, a shareholder of Nestle. Just someone gave me two shares that were, you know, actually multiplied out. But um, Brabec, tying corporations up in regulatory straitjackets is unnecessary when companies such as Nestle already have sound principles and core values. So they're actually saying this. You don't need to do it. And that's how they, they use the CR, CSR. So then I'm fast-forwarding to the UN now. And the UN uh, and is now focusing on, and the EU as well, EU development, business of malnutrition. Oh, dear, poor starving babies. We've got stunted babies. We must do something about it. We must send them products. So this is Hillary Clinton and everything working with a pizza company, on how they can get them involved. You've got World Food Program, you know, all this thing. And it's all about, and there you've got Pepsi breakfast at the UN when we're talking about NCDs. Some of, I don't know whether anybody else is here who was there at that time. That's in, in 2011, that Derek Yak talking then, trying to convince everybody. But it's, 
it's really... Derek Yak was the Assistant Director General of the WHO who got headhunted by Pepsi yeah. to do the sort of try and invest in sustainability and health inside Pepsi. Yeah, yeah. And he did try in that thing, but again, you know, the story goes that they, they, they've reverted right back now, you know, because it, they, it needs to make money. The bottom line is the money. Um, so, the, but the thing that's really worrying us and I, I at the moment is this business of mal, uh, scaling up nutrition. And this is an initiative set up by not Kofi Annan, but the uh, Anki Moon to bring everybody under one umbrella and work for children. And so they're looking at undernutrition and stunting. And, of course, it means sending out processed foods. And we've been highly critical of this. Ibfan has stood right outside it and said, and issued this paper, which we did in 2012, and said, this isn't a good way to go. You are, you are encouraging governments in the poorest country in the world to set up platforms and partnerships with businesses to solve malnutrition. This is not the way to go. You are, you are just bringing them into a situation where those governments are not able to cope with it. So this, it's partnership, the partnership approach from our perspective is an arrangement for shared governance to achieve shared goals, shared decision making is the single most unifying feature. They pave the way for voluntary self-regulation uh, regulation, and they imply respect, trust and shared benefits. It's really important this and that's why we, and we've come under great stress over this because everybody's getting involved in SAM now. It's massive and we just will not join it because we think it's really a, a faulty thing. Some, in, because we criticised it so severely, they've tweaked a few things and they got in this conflict of interest, global corporate, what's it called, observatory, global, I've forgotten his name actually. And anyway, the global social observatory, industry funded body. And of course, what do they do? They focus on trust and collaboration. They confuse conflicts of interest with conflicts caused by disagreements. They promote good governance as inclusiveness of all stakeholders. So they, they haven't understood what a conflict of interest is anyway. They think you can sit down. If I've got a conflict of interest with you, I just sit down. You promise to do the code. And I say, oh, well, that's OK then. And we'll work together. Do you see, that is not a conflict of interest. A conflict of interest is it's not between two entities. It's not between you and me. It's with WHO or with the UN wanting to go and get money from somewhere or, and then, then thinking, oh, I'll get that money from that place. But, and then the money side of it is messing up their, their objective, which is to protect health for all. And that's the key thing. The conflict is within an organisation. And until we understand that, and if we think it's always outside between two people, you'll never actually crack it. So what we're doing now is at the moment really putting the pressure on WHO to do that. And I, they're meeting today, tomorrow and the next day to discuss this very thing, the interactions with what they call non-state actors. How am I doing for time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. The question is, and it came up this afternoon... Is WHO a norm-setting body? We focus on WHO and UNICEF because it's absolutely critical for us. As you can see, we work with getting these resolutions into legislation. So if it's a norm-setting body, it doesn't need a huge amount of money. But it does need some money, and it needs member states to provide that money. And it needs to have the cap lifted. There, there, is, a, there is a cap on how much member states can give. But at the moment... The US and the UK and the other industrialised countries are pushing WHO to be an implementing organisation. That means they go out and deliver drugs and whatever. This is not the role for WHO. It should be setting sugar standards, what you do in malaria, what you do in Ebola. And that, but that is highly political. And that is something the US and the UK don't want WHO to get messed up with. You see? So it's a real political struggle here between what WHO's real purpose is to protect health for all or is it to be a tool of those, and they will be the pharmaceutical and food industries and everything in industrialised countries. Whether WHO will take on big food, it already says absolutely no to big tobacco, but it then 
big food is, is the big one in the room. And what do they do about it? Because a lot of the member states don't want big food to be in there in these consult working relationship with WHO. Um, but the real problem is, of course, WHO's funding is coming from people like Bill Gates and the Clinton Foundation and others. So the private philanthropists, which have always been a bit of a problem. <laughs> So um, that's a, that you can't see it very well, but this is a Gates organogram showing you the interlink. And I'm not saying Gates is all bad. Of course, Bill and Melinda, they're doing what they think is right. But it is absolutely locked into a market-led approach and a public-private partnership approach. And IBFAN has taken the thing that we will not take Ib Gates' money while it's doing that. If it changes, we might see but, and the, but we will work with governments and WHO and UNICEF because UNICEF, we have to. We have to work with people who take Gates money, but we won't take the, the Gates money ourselves. Um, that's the other thing I wanted to bring up. Stakeholders replacing citizens and the vocabulary of the European Union. Um, this actually came from Susan George last night. She just emailed, she was talking about it, Sorry. that a stake it always designates a material, financial, or commercial interest of some kind or a bet as in playing poker for higher stakes. I love that. Or I've got a stake on that horse. So in Ibfan, we try and sort of just say, please, we're not a stakeholder, and please don't call this a stakeholder thing. We're, you know, we're citizens or whatever else. So that's my colleague Leader did this dreadful cartoon. I love it, though. Because you, you, some people have really big stakes, and you might have only a sausage or a veggie burger or whatever. OK. Um, another thing I want you to remember... World Economic Forum, whose chair is Nestle P Peter Brabeck. Uh, I think Tony Blair was on with him as well, wasn't he? Um, but they're proposing that issues are taken off the agenda of the UN system and addressed by plurilateral, often multi-stakeholder coalitions of the willing and able. <laughs> so these will be your multinational corporations, <coughs> nation states, and select civil society organisations, of course, the ones that work in partnership with industry. Now, this is absolutely terrifying, and this is what's happening, and this is, for me, the major problem, because once that happens, you have nowhere to go except civil disobedience and riots and nice you know, campaigns, which we do, by the way, not riots, but we do sort of gentle campaigns in the street, don't we? we nothing illegal, for God's sake. Um, then briefly we haven't got very much time Europe is it a paradise we're doing a huge campaign now on Europe because Europe is the European Commission is sort of saying the only laws they can bring in are on um, uh, food safety and I think that's wrong I think blah 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 so we're having a big push and one <laughs> part of it we're going to say actually if you're going to look at food safety then a lot of the Europeans don't have access to all the things that you say they are. And this is only going to get worse with climate change and whatever. So no time to go through that. And then, but the other issue, I just want to fill it off the drawings. <laughs> I, do this I, think I need a man in a, you know, who's saying he's got the right to advertise. So if you take a rights space abroad, be very careful. Because as the Americans always sort of like... In, you know, due to constitutional concerns, both by some member states and their restrictions, a recital of uh, fundamental rights of the freedom of expression. You know, but what about the baby's rights? You can help me on that, Tim. It's one of these puzzling problems. And, you know, Nestle has this talking the human rights, as Peter was saying there. You know, they, they've got it. So there is a big conflict at the heart of the EU. They've got this thing where they've got to be seen as EU helping, you know, protecting health. But at the same time, they know that a kilo of infant formula is worth ten times the value of a kilo of ordinary milk. So, you know, they've got to compete with New Zealand. It's, it's obvious that they're going to be torn. There's a lot of money to be made here. So we're just trying to say, remember, remember the child health. On the other hand, they'll say breastfeeding's a thing of the past anyway. Who wants to do it? I mean, for God's sake. It's ancient. It's been going on for long enough. We've got marvellous formulas. And the whole of the EU is sort of geared into innovation. So you'll have nighttime milks, morning milks, cat milks, this milk. I mean, massive range of milks now. You know, more with melatonin, isn't there? They're milking the cows at night and everything. Anyway, so what we're saying, we actually brought in the, um, we, our campaign exposing the industry funding of doctors 
actually started the whole EFSA process because we brought that it was Glynis Kinnock and us. We we actually said they should they were linked up, so they closed down the scientific committee for food and set up EFSA. But that still has conflicts of interest, but it's much much better than it was, and it was at least it does at least have to declare its interests. But there's still a lot, as we all know, of conflicts of interest. But at least it does do things. So these markets, which I think are triggered by sun, looking at nutrients, building, making parents feel that their breastfeeding and their ordinary formulas and their ordinary family foods are not, not sufficient. If you look at a banana, you don't know what's in it. Whereas you've got a micronutrient supplement telling you've got all these vitamin A, D and whatever. So I, we're really against that. And these are the sort of claims that come. This is an American claim, and this was all in Europe. We weren't able to stop this one. We had Parliament uh, voted against it, and we couldn't stop it. So they're all, and they're all these sort of working on the micronutrients. I think I'm nearly at the end now. Tigers. This is the film that we, uh, Rosie came to see it. <laughs> so you can say, I mean, this is a movie film that we've been working on about a whistleblower within Nestle, and we hope very much to be able to use this film to cut across a lot of different things. It's a proper movie film that should be in the cinemas in the summer. But it's about a whistleblower, and it's about sponsorship, and it's about how doctors are lured in. So do look, look out for that when you, when you have... Um, and these are some of the press publicity, and it's doing the rounds now of festivals and things. But whistleblower is t really important. I think we mustn't forget the importance of whistleblowing in food safety. This woman used to work for Nestle for 10 <coughs> years and WHO for 10 years and is now a really good whistleblower. She's fantastic on food safety. Do you know her, Yasmin Motajimi? She's really good. Okay? So I can stop there or I can just flip you through other, you know, scams, you know, food banks in Canada. Nestle food banks. I mean, really giving you. Let's take some questions. Yeah, we we'll take some questions now. Okay. No, this is. Um, I asked Patty. <laughs>